She made it sound like it might take a while. That was quick. <laughs> Praise God when you can be seated. I come ready tonight with all my markers. And um, we are going to, I've known for several weeks that I wanted to talk about the miracles of Azusa Street. And I find myself, of course, I've been reading it for a while, and you hear me refer to it from time to time, and so some of you may have already purchased the book, but we do have these available now. It is April's Book of the Month. Awesome. You're not going to have any trouble reading this book. I mean, I've read through it several times, and I have a hard time putting it down. So um, make sure you get it, make sure you read it, because this book is going to help usher in some things that God has for the church. Amen. And let's turn, let's start out tonight turning to Matthew chapter 5. I'm not necessarily going to read a lot of scripture tonight, but I am going to read some stories to you right. and discuss some things. So I hope you came alert. Yeah. And I know how it is after working all day and it gets cozy in here. <laughs> If you fall asleep, the person next to you is authorized to sprinkle you with water. <laughs> and you might think, oh, it's the anointing. Because <laughs> it's too good to fall asleep on this stuff. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Of course, Jesus, this is the Beatitudes, and he says a lot of things, but in verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 6 of chapter 5. He said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. <laughs> Do you realize what filled means? <laughs> the Amplified says it this way, Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation. Now, that tells you a story right there, that a born-again child of God ought to be enjoying their salvation, Amen. enjoying their favor. Yes. They ought to be happy. Yes. <laughs> At least try to look happy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know me, it doesn't take much to make me laugh. Uh -huh. I, I love that movie, I'll Be Home for Christmas, uh, with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. I've told this story before, and this guy is driving a van and almost runs him over. And the guy is just like, oh my gosh, I almost ran, or I, I gone ahead and killed Santa. <laughs> he didn't have all his marbles up there. So at one point, they're driving this van, <laughs> And uh, he's speeding, and a cop starts pulling, you know, coming behind him with the siren going. And so they're going to pull him over, and he's like, oh, no, I'm hauling stolen goods. <laughs> and so Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who's dressed like Santa, not because he wants to be, he's got the Santa hat on. He says, oh, don't worry about this. I got this. I'll, I'll just tell him we're, you know, doing good deeds for children. And so he happened to have this elf hat, and he said, just put this on. And he puts the elf hat on, and he said, well, what am I supposed to do? And he said, just act happy. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he makes this weird look like... And you have to see it. How many ever saw that movie where he makes that face? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, that was priceless. I just thought that was so hysterical. So. We're supposed to at least look happy. <laughs> that was the reason I told that whole story. <laughs> You're a child of God. Look happy. Amen. The rest of the Amplified says... Uh, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. Yeah. I'm not completely satisfied. Not yet. But we will be. Especially as we see more and more of what God has in store for us before Jesus comes back. So I'm going to start out tonight reading to you from page 29 in this book. And what this is, is the prophecy, 100-year uh, prophecy, they call it. It said, sometime in 1910, Seymour, William Seymour, of course, was uh, 
the main preacher that facilitated the awakening at Azusa Street. It says Seymour just stood up on the stage, took the box off his head. You'll get when you read the story, you'll understand. He used to come out with a box over his head, very peculiar. But <laughs> the Lord let actually led him to do that. And for two reasons. First of all, it would keep all the distractions out. Yes. Secondly, it sure would humble you fast. Yeah. You, you're not going to come out there on the stage thinking you're all that with a box on your head. <laughs> <laughs> and when he sensed it was the right time to take the box off, now this is how I know it was God, the miracles. Yeah. And of all the miracles that took place there, the ones that were performed by Seymour were the greatest mm -hmm. and the most profound. But when you read that book and you see what was done by the average teenager, yeah. mm -hmm. you can just imagine what Seymour must have been doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so he took the box off of his head and started <laughs> prophesying, and he said in about 100 years there would be another revival like Azusa Street, only this time it would not be in one place. It would be all over the world. Mm -hmm. There would be a return of the Shekinah glory and the miracles. Now, for those of you that might not know what the Shekinah glory is, the glory of God would be in manifestation in that place every day like a thick cloud, like a mist. And all of these young people saw it. See, this was a, an awakening that didn't just have one or two people that saw things. They all experienced it. They would; These kids would play in it. Can you imagine playing wow. in God's glory? Wow. Now, this is the prophecy that there's going to be a return of the Shekinah glory and the miracles. This revival would not be with just one person or just pastors. It would be with everybody in the body. This time, the revival will not end until the Lord returns. Wow. Seymour repeated this revelation more than once. All the saints told Tommy this prophecy. Now, Tommy Welchel is the one who wrote the book. What you'll find out is when he was about 17 or 18, he met, um, he was a troubled child <laughs> on the beach somewhere, uh, drug and alcohol problems. His dad was a moonshiner and had started putting hard liquor in his bottles as a toddler. Wow. And so he was definitely a troubled person that got into trouble. And he came across this precious old lady saint who was probably in her 60s, but he called her old because he was 18. <laughs> you know, we're not old in our 60s, right? Or, or 70s or 80s. But, and somehow or another, she ministered to him and got him to pray with her, even though he said everything in me wanted to resist her. He couldn't. And she took him back with her to a place called Pisgah. Well, Pisgah, if you read your Old Testament was the mountain that God took Moses up to to show him the promised land before he died. And this place in California, I'm not even sure if it's still there today, uh, the Los Angeles area, was a place that was built uh, the, in the late 1800s uh, by a Dr. Yoakum, who also has an astounding testimony, which you'll read in this book. Uh, he was, in his day, he was a brain surgeon. Can't even imagine in the 1800s. <laughs> Making $15,000 a month wow. in the late 1800s. Wow. That's a lot. And he gave that up after he got saved and spirit-filled. You have to read his story. But this particular doctor gave his life to the work of the Lord and started this place that was for people to rescue people that were on skid row and gave them a new life. And so over the years, uh, some of these young teenagers and people that were in their early 20s during the Azusa Street Revival, which was like 1905, 1906 to 1909, something like that. I think it was 06 to 09. Mo uh, many of them retired at this place called Pisgah and lived there in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Hmm. And this young man, Tommy, when he was a teenager, was living there with these saints and would sit at their feet and heard their stories and he wrote them down. And as I said, when you read this book, you will find the, the details to how he got there, how it was supernatural, it was a divine call from God, how it was even prophesied over him by William Brand Branham, for example, mm -hmm. that he was the one. Like, these saints wouldn't tell their stories to uh, famous people that wanted them. They just wouldn't tell it. Because they all had this revelation that there's, there's one that we're supposed to save this for. And they didn't know who it was till he got there, but it was this young man, Tommy. And likely because of his age, because he could carry it for many more years to come. 
I'm not sure if this man's alive today, Tommy Welcher. He may have passed away recently. Um, but anyway, so I'm just telling you that filling in a little bit of the blanks here. So this is Tommy who wrote the book. So all the saints told Tommy this prophecy. On the opposite coast in New York City, according to Charles Parham's granddaughter, Parham just stood up one day and declared the same prophecy using almost the exact words. So it's happening in L.A., and then it's happening in New York at the same time. They both pronounced that this modern-day outpouring would surpass Acts 2, Topeka, and Azusa. Celebrate. We are now in the 100-year period, and you are alive in this time. Amen. According to Jesus in Luke 10, 24, we are the envy of prophets and kings to see such an outpouring of the Spirit. Now, I just happened to read this scripture to you several times in the last few weeks. Jesus said, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. The hundred-year prophecy is coming to pass, as you will see uh, in the following chapters. The telling of these stories has triggered this next mighty move of God and fulfilled prophecies spoken over Tommy decades ago. He was prophesied over by William Branham, by Tommy Hicks, by Jean Darnell, who happened to, um, when Amy Semple McPherson went to heaven, Jean Darnell took over as pastor of that church. And she was still alive and pastoring at this time when Tommy was 18 at Pisgah. So he met all kinds of people. He's been on Sid Roth's program in the past. He's uh, got to know Billy Brim, who has uh, Prayer Mountain in the Ozarks in Missouri. And um, it's just, a, you're not going to want to put the book down. Okay, so... The Lord just put it in my heart weeks ago to read you some stories out of this book. And, you know, as I got to the very end of the book, after I already planned to do this, then he shares some testimonies of preachers who read these stories from the book in their churches. I thought, wow. So I didn't get the idea from the book. It came from the Holy Spirit. And he said, everywhere these pastors read these stories, miracles broke out. The, you know, the glory of God would come in manifestation and things would happen. Glory. So I can't promise you anything tonight. Everything's as the Spirit wills, but I just know that we need to hear this. Amen. Now, he would sit at the feet of these saints, as I said, and they would usually give him chocolate chip cookies, <laughs> something homemade and milk, you know. And anyway, it says here, just to give you a little history of, of William Seymour, Seymour was blind in one eye and the son of slaves. He listened and learned about the Holy Spirit from Charles Parham, who preached in a suburb of Houston called Pasadena in Texas. By the way, Pasadena is where the Goodwins pastored, which we, we've mentioned before. Seymour sat outside the sanctuary and listened through a crack in the door. He couldn't go in and sit with the congregation because of his color and the Jim Crow laws. But Seymour did not get mad. He just sat outside and listened. He wanted whatever they had, and he got it. In a short time, now see, here's the point of that. Offense will keep you from getting what God has for you. We can't control people. We can't control wicked men, but we can control what we receive. And it says, in a short time, Parham would be sending people like John G. Lake and F.F. F. Bosworth to Azusa Street to come under Seymour's anointing before they went into the mission field. Wow. He would tell them, before you go overseas as missionaries, go to Azusa Street and make sure you become friends with Seymour and make sure you hang around him, Parham instructed. Get all of his anointing that you can. God loves irony. The black man who had to sit outside of Parham's doors became the man whom everyone sought. The world came to Azusa. The segregation that Seymour and so many sadly experienced stands in great contrast to what Azusa Street became in that same period of history. So you have to understand yeah. the miracle of this whole thing for that hour and that right. day. Yeah. It says Azusa Street was the first fully integrated church in America. Wow. Seymour also became fanatical about it. When he would come down from his apartment above the church... If 20 or more of the same color were sitting together, he'd split them up. Amen. He wouldn't tolerate it. Yeah, he said we were to be one in the Lord. Amen. 
he went as far as saying that once a person becomes a Christian, he or she becomes a new creature that never existed before yeah, and belongs right. to a different right. race, yeah. the Christian race. Yeah. 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 We stay the same color, but we are all one race. That's right. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. when the saints told me their stories, they never mentioned the color of the person they healed, That's right. ever. Yeah. It's as if everyone was colorblind. Frank Bartleman said it simply, the color line was broken by the blood. Amen. I just wanted you to see the power of yes. the glory of God. Yeah. How there is nothing that can stand in the way of the, of the, the glory. And see, today we're seeing that spirit, uh, that divisive spirit of racism has been so strong. And it's, it's not, you know, there's a difference between uh, doing the right thing in life and the, the spirit that's behind it. Let me try to put it that way. And um, that spirit that we're seeing so strong today is the opposite of the spirit of Christ. It's an antichrist spirit. But you see, when you get the power of God and the glory of God and the miracles of God flowing, all of that just comes to nothing. Because God is love. And where his fullness is, there's a fullness of love. Another thing that was interesting... Um, all of these saints said the same thing. Whenever the people worshipped by singing in tongues, the power was greater and the anointing fell on the service. Okay, here's something that's going to interest you. He's, he, each chapter has a title. Like this, for instance, says, What's in a Name? Say hello to Sister Lucille and Sister Laura. Azusa, ages 18 and 16. Now, of course, they all were called sister and brother, and these women all had their Pentecostal buns. <laughs> and he said they even wore those, those um, mob cattle boots with the hooks in the, you know, in the 60s. So, Okay, now this is a true story, guys. Television star Lucille Ball wanted what Sister Lucille had, her last name. Sister Lucille's last name was McGillicuddy. Lucille Ball paid Sister Lucille handsomely to use it as the maiden name of her television character in I Love Lucy. Isn't that interesting? So she paid, I don't know how she heard of Lucille McGillicuddy, but I'll tell you what, so much was happening at Azusa that um, word spread and even famous people were touched by this yeah. revival. But her name is not all that she is remembered for. Sister Lucille McGillicuddy made quite a name for herself by becoming the secretary for Amy Semple McPherson and her successor, Jean Darnell. Before that, she was one of the youth who impacted the lives of many during the Azusa Street Revival. I met Sister Lucille at Pisgah, and she couldn't have weighed much more than 90 pounds and stood under 5 feet tall. She was very slender and petite. Like many of the Pentecostal women of that day, she had long hair that almost touched the floor, but wore it in a glory bun held together by a host of hairpins. <laughs> and if they got to dancing, you know what happened to those hairpins. <laughs> you remember Dr. Dufresne's story of the woman that played the ham in B3, and she had the glory bun that kept flapping all over the place? <laughs> Some of us modern-day folks just missed out on so much, didn't we? <laughs> he said, she was one of the Azusa saints whom I had the honor of listening to as I sat at her feet and munched on homemade chocolate chip cookies. Yes, I washed them down always with the cold glass of milk she had waiting for me. During her Azusa day, she was part of the Carney Riggs Ward Anderson group. Now, these are last names of people that were also teenagers Ward uh, was C.M. Ward, who ended up being part of founding the Assemblies of God right. years ago. So there was a lot of roots back here. Um, anyway, first she told me about the lady who had one leg shorter than the other. Her name was Goldie, and she had polio, causing one leg to be more than four inches shorter than the other. Now, if you know, four inches is... It's significant. Um... She said, Sister Lucille, he said, Sister Lucille insisted that Goldie take the brace off and allow God to heal her. Goldie told Lucille, if I take the brace off, I better be healed. <laughs> now, you're going to read this book and you're going to realize that there's not always a lot of faith talk. But let me just make this statement that I heard Brother Hagen say years ago. He said, the degree of anointing plus the degree of faith 
equals the outcome. Mm -hmm. So because the anointing was so strong at Azusa, it didn't require as high a level of faith. But you will see that these teenagers that perform miracles really did have faith. Right. Yeah. They fully expected everyone they touched to be healed. Right. But sometimes the people, a lot of times the people that came in didn't fully believe they'd be healed. Yeah. Yeah. But it was made up for by these other factors. Yeah. So she said, Sister Lucille smiled and said, you will be, now take it off. She took off the brace and Sister Lucille immediately prayed for her. Now remember, Lucille is 18 at this time. So um, she prayed for her, and as Goldie and Lucille sat there, the leg lengthened. Amen. Lucille told her to get up and walk. She took her first steps and almost fell over because she was not accustomed to walking with normal legs. Miraculously, both legs were the same length. Next, with a twinkle in her eye, she would tell me about the woman whose wrist was shattered in a domestic squabble. The woman couldn't use her hand at all. Sister Lucille said, it looks like your wrist has been crushed. She responded, my husband hit it with a mallet. Oh. He was mad at me and thought he would teach me a lesson and crush my wrist. Now, don't get any ideas, husbands. But this is the point I'm making is there was, there was so much going on years ago. You know, we think we're living in such hard times. Come on, guys. There were no advocates for women. Your husband ruled the roost, and if he was a monster, you were stuck with it. So you can see some of these miracles, you know, were so critical. And not only that, you didn't have access to medical care. There was no such thing as medical insurance. So unless you were wealthy, you had all of these health issues that you could not cure without money. So you're going to read some stories in here that, you know, things you might not hear about today. So, Sister Lucille told me that it just broke her heart. She earnestly wanted the lady healed, and when she prayed, she all but begged God to heal her. After her prayer, she said to the wrist, I say in the name of Jesus, you do what I told you and be healed. Amen. Immediately, the lady's wrist was totally restored. Amen. Sister Lucille's next story was not a cookies and milk story. It was a more like toss your cookie story. <laughs> she would tell about the miracles performed on people who had very bad teeth, and usually I would lose my appetite. <laughs> now think about this, you didn't have access to dental care That's like true. today. Right. And you know, even if you look at old movies, nobody's teeth were ultra white. No. I heard it said somewhere that Europeans can always tell an American now because their teeth are so white. Yeah. Now, you know, when you look at old movies, nobody's teeth, even in the 80s, yeah, the nobody's teeth good. were bright white because there was no such thing as whitening. Yeah. But then you also always saw people with teeth missing. Yeah. Crooked. I mean, all and crooked, very crooked. Yeah. You know, I have grandparents and uh, great uncles and aunts and uncles that had terrible teeth. Yeah. And that was pretty common. Yeah. So it says she would tell about the miracles she performed on people, and she would have them open their mouths, and she would stick her fingers on the teeth that were bad, and pray for healing. I asked her, were they infected and filled with bad stuff? And she would look at me with a half grin on her face. I said, you stuck your finger on their teeth? With that half grin on her face, she said, yeah. Well, what if there wasn't a tooth there, I would ask playfully. Sister Lucille took her story over the top. I would stick my finger on the bare gum, in fact, many times I would push against the gum and let the new tooth push my finger up. On uh, the really decayed teeth, all the bad stuff would come out, and we would use a handkerchief to rub the bad stuff off, and there would be a new tooth. Even crooked teeth would straighten. Usually teeth rotted because of diet and or poor hygiene. This, this next story she told me was of a child whose second teeth grew in rotten and black from the start. The mother asked, will God heal this? Lucille said, God will heal anything, and I love praying for teeth. Lucille brought the girl over to her and asked others to get a handkerchief and a cup. Lucille took the handkerchief and laid it over the child's mouth. She prayed, and then a handful of blackened teeth just dropped out of the girl's mouth and into the cup. Can you imagine what that this girl is thinking as this little woman is taking out her teeth? Completely toothless, the child just kept looking at her. And Lucille told her, now, Jesus is going to give you a new set of teeth, and we're going to have fun getting them in there. 
She went through the child's whole mouth, pressing on her gums, and teeth grew in one at a time. She could have had them all done at one time, but Lucille wanted to play. <laughs> you know, think about it. They weren't fast, 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 fast moving society either like we are today. They had three services a day at Azusa, and some of these teenagers were at all three, five days a week. So anyway, um, she said, that little girl's teeth grew in perfectly. Did it hurt when the rotten teeth were coming in, I asked? Lucille said the child felt nothing. However, when the new Jesus teeth came in, I like that, the little girl said it kind of tickled. I just sat there shaking my head. Even though her descriptions of the teeth often caused my stomach to turn, I sat in awe at the miracle she described. She would ask me, Tommy, wouldn't you love to see those kind of healings in our services today? And I would just nod in agreement. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What impressed Sister Lucille was that the miracles were not confined to Brother Seymour. She would comment, a little bitty woman like me could walk up and command a leg to grow out, and it would grow out. A busted wrist would grow back together. Rotten teeth would be replaced with brand new teeth, and missing teeth would grow back in. I asked her if she ever worked with someone who had all his teeth missing, and she said, no, I never tried that. I teasingly said, well, you should have. And she rebukingly replied, I just never tried that, Brother Tommy. <laughs> so I would meekly change the subject and ask her to describe what the Shekinah glory was like. And, of course, you all can read all of that because there's just too much to share otherwise in one night. Uh, another thing I wanted to share with you, because uh, I just wanted to give you a variety of stories. Um, here's a really good one. Brother David began with the story of the Grand Central Station experience. David lived about a half mile on the other side of Grand Central Station, and he walked right by it coming to the Azusa Street warehouse. One evening, he ran to the meeting to find Frank Bartleman and told him that he needed to come to Grand Central Station. Why, what's going on there, Bartleman asked out of curiosity. Brother Garcia, his name was David Garcia, and he was a, a Mexican-American. So there was diversity even then. Uh, Brother Garcia, while trying to catch his breath, explained, you've got to come and see this. The anointing is far beyond where it has been in the past. You have to come down and see. Together, Bartleman and Garcia ran down to the station that was a half mile away from the warehouse. There they witnessed people coming in from all over the world, get off the train, walk across the platform, and fall out in the spirit, often speaking in tongues. Wow. Someone had commented that the phenomenon had been happening all day long. Wow. Now, can you imagine something like that happening in a major place like that? Wow. See, guys, don't be too concerned about what's happening on the political scene today. Yeah. God can do something like this and change everything yeah. in a short period of time. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. He said when he first saw people lying all over the platform area, he thought it was a disaster <laughs> until he realized what was going on and ran to find Bartleman. Frank had talked about a line or a circle of blood several blocks around the Azusa warehouse where the power of God extended outward. Several blocks before reaching, reaching the warehouse, people were being healed, falling out in the spirit, and speaking in tongues for the first time. But this was the first time God's power had reached all the way to Grand Central Station. Wow. And although no miracles were taking place, the presence and power of God without question had now moved out a half mile from the actual warehouse. Wow. And he said, we have got to get the Shekinah back if we want to see a worldwide revival. Yeah. I asked Brother David, did you ever see the flames? Because that was pretty common that they would see flames on the building and send the fire department. He told me how he'd get off work during the wintertime and it would be dark. He'd take the bus home, shower, and come out on his porch looking across the Arroyo Seco River. Some nights he could see the flames shooting up 50 feet into the sky and coming down out of the sky. He said, Brother Tommy, I'd run the whole way. I didn't walk. I ran shouting, glory, hallelujah, because big things were happening at Azusa when those flames were there. He said, the greater the Shekinah glory, the greater the power. Wow. Yeah. We know Brother yeah. Copeland told a, told a story recently. I think he was in another country, but while he was having <laughs> services in a particular church, 
there was a few people at a hospital <clears throat> quite a distance away that received miracles and healings. So some of that has happened. <clears throat> Here's one. <clears throat> you all still awake? Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. This one's entitled, What God Has Joined Together. Say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Lankford, ages 20 and 18. While most 17-year-old boys chase after girls, <laughs> Brother Lankford pursued God. Amen. His hunger for more of God took him from Highland Park, California to Topeka, Kansas in 1903. Mm. This was the city in which Dr. Charles Parham had started a Bible school where he taught the new concept, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, accompanied by the gift of tongues. Now remember, Dr. Parham was Brother Seymour's pastor in Pasadena, Texas. So under Parham's witness, Brother Langford received the baptism and the gift himself. Uh, he returned to California in 04. He was introduced, uh, he introduced this new teaching to Dr. Yoakum, who's the one who founded Pisgah. So all these people are connected. And then eventually when Azusa started, he found himself there. Now, he told this story about, uh, first of all, a man who had gotten two fingers caught in some type of machine. And before he knew it, the machine had ripped off two of his fingers. And he had heard that astonishing miracles happened at the warehouse on Azusa, so he came with expectation of getting healed. Amen. And Brother Langford shocked the man by asking, can we see what God will do? And the man, somewhat puzzled, replied, what do you mean? Let's ask God to grow them out, Langford was very bold and outspoken about it. So with the man's approval, he grabbed the man's hand and instructed him to put it up in the air, and holding the man's hand up high, and with Sister Langford holding up his arm, he began to pray, and the man's fingers began to grow out. Sister Langford passed out from the sight of such a miracle. <laughs> so Langford started taking the man around, shouting that his fingers had just grown out. <laughs> these weren't here before. Look, God grew out these fingers. You know, when you look at the picture, uh, which... I think there's a picture, like at the beginning of each, chap each chapter in black and white. The building at Azusa is not a huge place. No. You just wonder where all the people were packed in. So this, this chapter is kind of fun because there's a lot of different miracles in here. Um, this is a memorable miracle they had. A lady had a very bad hunchback. Her back didn't just curve over, but it was twisted. She was probably around 50 to 55 years old. And she told Sister Langford that the problem had started when she was about 30, and it had just gotten worse and worse. And the doctor wanted to put her into a nursing home, and even though her husband agreed, uh, he agreed because she could hardly get around. Well, her husband brought her to Azusa, thinking that maybe God would do something at the revival Amen. meeting. Amen. So Brother Langford came over and laid his hands on the hunched back and started praying for her. And you could hear the popping of the bones. Within minutes, right before their eyes, she was healed. And she broke into dancing and even went up onto the platform dancing and screaming. Hallelujah. And, of course, it would just start a whole praise service. There was another man who was crippled in a wheelchair, and he wouldn't let the doctors cut his legs off. He explained that he had worked as a brakeman for the railroad and had been crippled in an accident uh, when the train pinned his legs down and broke many of his bones. And you could tell through his pants that the bones in his legs were kind of knotty, but he didn't want to show anyone. So he came wheeling himself the whole way there, and uh, they, you know, they said, it's a miracle they didn't cut your legs off. And he said, I've been paralyzed from the waist down for about two years. They wanted to amputate, but I wouldn't let them. So before <laughs> Langford started praying for him, and Sister Carney, who was observing, broke in and corrected him. Now, Sister Carney started this principle that they all had to keep, that if you're going to pray for someone in a wheelchair, you always have to pick up their legs and put the foot rests up so they can get up, because they are doing this with expectation. Amen. And she expected him to get up. Amen. So after they did that, he prayed for the man, and you could hear the bones cracking and see the legs just straighten up. Wow. And the man got out of his wheelchair and went flying. Wow. <laughs> It's no wonder they had such a revival. No wonder this thing went worldwide. Yes, they received the speaking in tongues, and that was great. But many of the miracles that were performed were not done by big preachers. Mm -hmm. Many of those being used by God were just ordinary teenagers and young people doing extraordinary works with God. Mm 
Hallelujah. Glory to God. Here's another thing. He was blessed with the great gift of helping people who had cleft palates and lips to receive healing. The majority of them were children. You know, that was a lot more common than it is today. And uh, they didn't have the, the high technology surgeries. I mean, they still have them today. But So it says some of those who came there uh, for healing had never had operations or medical treatment, and there would be big gaps in their mouths, and he would pray for them, and the gaps would be filled in. And sometimes some of their teeth would be gone, and the teeth would be restored. And he said that over the three-year period he was there, that God used him in healing around 100 people with cleft palates. Wow. That's just one man, 100 people just with cleft palates. Because most of them were just kids, he became known as Papa to the children he healed. When they'd come back to see him, he was Papa. Now, here's a, here's a story that's a little bit on the interesting side, but I thought you'd enjoy it. He says, now this is the first time I've dared to tell this next story. It may make a listener or reader blush, but it's fresh in my mind. A couple came in one, one day, and the wife was very upset, even to the point of divorce. When Brother Langford asked what was the problem, the wife complained that they couldn't have sex anymore because her husband was impotent. They were in their 70s, but that was no matter. She wanted intimacy. She didn't want him to stop being a man. She needed a man. So Brother Langford said, oh, that can't happen. That's wrong. <laughs> Glory to God. Sorry if you young years didn't you know, want to hear that. but So he said, that can't happen. That's wrong. No, that shouldn't die. See, the Langfords were older when they told me the story. <laughs> He said, the Langfords were older when they told me the story, and they were still very intimate. He said, that's the devil, he said to the man. So he laid hands on the man and ordered that spirit to leave him and for him to be healed enough to make his wife happy. That was it. A few nights later, the couple came back, and she said, oh, my, my, he's more frisky than he was when we first got married. <laughs> I thought you'd get a laugh out of that. <laughs> Better watch what you pray for. Glory <laughs> to God. <laughs> now here's a story that you'll find interesting. <clears throat> I mean, children with Down syndrome were healed. One particular lady prayed for maybe two dozen of those who were healed from Down syndrome. And he said he was lucky enough to meet one of them. And even though he still, his face had the characteristics of someone with Downs, he acted completely normal. And that was, you know, 50 years or plus later, 60 years later. Uh, here's another story. He said, this next story surprised me even more. I still marvel when I think of it. One day, Sister Dundee found a horribly disfigured child around five years old amongst the people at Azusa Street. He had scars all around on his head. His family said that doctors literally had to piece his face back together after he fell from a staircase onto a concrete floor when he was about two and a half years old. The side of his face that took the impact was about one quarter of an inch lower than the rest of his head. Sister Dundee could tell he wasn't normal mentally either. Her reaction? Oh, how marvelous. God gets glory when things like this happen. The father asked things like, what? He's going to be healed, she declared. See, by this time, they didn't say God will. They said he is healed. They had so much confidence that God was going to heal everyone and everything. Amen. Let me hold Amen. the boy in my lap, she said, as she set him down and laid her hand on his head. Sister Dundee said she could see and feel her hand moving and shifting as she was praying. Finally, she took her hand away, and the boy's face was perfectly normal. Wow. He was healed mentally as well. Now, here's the shocker. This disfigured child grew up to be a handsome Hollywood star. His name was Robert Montgomery. He became an actor on stage and screen as well as a director. In 1937, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor for a Thriller called Night Must Fall. His daughter, Elizabeth Montgomery, starred in the hit TV show Bewitched in the 
Yes. So from grotesque disfigurement to a golden boy in Hollywood, how is that for a miracle? Wow. You know what else is interesting? I do when I read names like that, I look them up on Wikipedia just to see if there's any information. You can't tell from reading Wikipedia that he ever really lived for God. But if you're healed at the age of five and you didn't know what happened to you before that, and maybe if your parents don't keep it alive in your life, I don't know. But a miracle child. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, one last thing here. Um, well, a couple of last things, but that I'm going to read. Here's another miracle. It involved a little bitty, barely 12-year-old girl. <coughs> well, not bitty. She was grossly overweight. Steve had prayed over her before. Brother Steve, I've got to lose some weight. I don't want to go to school because they're making so much fun of me and teachers won't make them stop. Now, this is 1906 to 1909. Bullying has been around forever, guys. He said, well, we'll pray for you and see what God will do. He prayed for her again, and then he went on to someone else. I kept glancing over at this child. I watched her shrink. Now, wait a minute. This story that I'm telling you, Tommy actually witnessed this in 2012. Okay? I watched her shrink. She shrunk to a perfect size and a very cute little girl. And when she stood up, her blouse looked like a tent on her, and she had to grab her pants and hold them up with one hand. <laughs> so now, towards the end of the book, he's telling more modern-day things that happen, and you'll see when you get to it, that this wasn't just for Azusa Street. But now, can you imagine? He said, three weeks later, this little girl got up and testified that she lost 40 pounds. She didn't diet. She didn't work out. She lost the weight supernaturally. This 12-year-old caught the fire of the Holy Spirit that night and started preaching and prophesying, which released miracles. And people started shedding pounds just by listening to her. Now that's my kind of weight loss program. Amen. 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 And there's so many interesting stories in here, so I know you're going to want to read it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just share with you is there's a difference between revival and awakening. Mm -hmm. So a revival means you're, you are reviving or restoring back to original state. Mm -hmm. And revival is for the saints yeah. or the believers because, you know, hopefully when you got saved, you were just excited as could be. Amen. If you weren't joyful, you'd have to question if you really were saved. Yeah. And I'll never forget when I was first saved, and especially that first year, I mean, everything was exciting. Everything was brand new, and you just were so full of joy and so on fire for God and telling everyone you know. But the longer you're a Christian, the you know, it can happen. It shouldn't, but it can happen that you can begin to lose your excitement and lose your zeal. And so God will have revivals from time to time to get the saints back where they belong. And we've had some over the years in this church. But what Azusa Street really was, was an awakening. Because it didn't just impact the saints. It was for the whole world. An awakening is for all people. And that's what we're talking about in this hour that we're living in, that, that we're coming into. Really, my personal theory on this, you can't, you know, take it to the bank or anything, is that this should have already been happening and been done with. We should already have been raptured. But somehow or another, the church got behind schedule in cooperating with the Spirit because now we're beyond 100 years. Mm -hmm. If we're talking 1909 or let's just say 1910, then by 2010 would have been about 100. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2021. So wow. church has to get with it. Now, there are things yeah. going on in other parts of the world, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing that uh, Tommy Welchel said is that we don't have to contend to have the 100-year prophecy fulfilled, but we have a part to play. In other words, we're not to strive to make it happen. It won't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But mainly praying and seeking God and preparing to receive it. So that's why if we spend too much time on frivolous things that don't profit anything, we're going to continue to postpone mm -hmm. what God has. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Final comments. <laughs> it says here... Brother Garcia summed up his experience with God at Azusa with these words. When you came into Azusa, 
you got healed. The more you attended, the more faith you had, and the more things would happen. Because your faith was building up as you saw other people believing, you soon had no doubt when you walked up to someone that he or she was going to get healed. Hmm. After a while, it was easy to have the boldness to walk up to anyone and proclaim, God is going to heal you tonight. There was no room for any seed of doubt in this fertile soil of faith. And I can just imagine what that atmosphere was like. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to share those stories. I could share a whole lot more, but you have the book. And if you don't have it, you can get it out in the uh, bookstore. And then also, I wanted to encourage you tonight with a song. We're going to play a song that Brother Trevor Woods wrote. He, um, This is on his second album, which we don't have for sale. But he, this is what I would call a spiritual song. When he... Um, when Pastor Nancy or someone is ministering, but primarily Pastor Nancy, he'll get songs from the Spirit of God on the spot that help reinforce the message. Mm -hmm. And this particular song is on his new album, which they've been playing at World Harvest for quite a while now, at least a few years. Mm -hmm. And just, just worship God as we play this and listen to the words, because it's exactly the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. loud enough for everyone to hear the words.
Sometimes I just come to tears because I have an appetite for this. Yeah. I want to see this. And, you know, yeah. it's not just for the preachers. Yeah. It's for everybody. Yeah. And there are going to be so many people that the preachers couldn't attend to them all. Yeah. So I really pray that you get this book and read it and just let it get you hungry. Yeah. Because that's what really will begin the process. And um, Amen. we've had all kinds of wonderful testimonies over the years, and yeah. God's been good to us, but yeah. not what we're reading about in here. Right. More. Yes, more. You know, Pastor more. Nancy talked about how she had that dream of somebody's leg beautifully growing out, and the Lord showed her, you can't, you have to see it first. You know, Jesus yeah. said, I only do what I see my Father do. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can imagine, because they saw so many things, yeah. they were able to do it again and again. Yeah. Because they saw it. Yeah. And the one that primarily paid the price was William Seymour because he spent all day upstairs praying. But as you read the story of these saints, even as teenagers, they also prayed and paid the price. Yeah. They spent a lot of time in prayer, prayer meetings, Bible studies. Some of them were prepared before Azusa started. And, um, and many of them were in three services a day. Yeah. So... Glory to God. Amen. Now, before we dismiss tonight, you can all stand. If there's anyone here that you came uh, wanting to receive hands laid upon you for healing, then I'll be happy to, to lay hands on you before we dismiss. Anybody? Glory to God. We're coming into an hour where that glory will just take care of everything, won't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I told Brother Charlie tonight, you've heard of Grizzly Adams. And I said, you're Grizzly Shore. <laughs> Summer's almost here. <laughs> Not yet, though. Yeah. Glory to God. Praise God. I like your beard. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> Sue, joyful Sue. Glory to God. forward. Father, in the name of Jesus, we agree together and release our faith for a miracle in, the, in this jaw and in her teeth. Oh, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for it. Be whole, be healed in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your power. We release that power now in Jesus' name. One of the stories I thought of that I just read today. There was a man in modern times, sometime after 2012, that had hundreds, thousands of people that would have fillings hmm. put in supernaturally that were gold. When they tested them, they were 23 carat, more wow. pure than anything we normally work with. And some even had diamonds in the middle of the gold. It wasn't dust falling from the sky, okay? There's some things that are just not of God. But literally something you needed to work done in their mouth, and it was done supernaturally. Well, praise the Lord. Just don't take the diamond and the gold and sell it. God put it in there. Keep it in there, right? Like infection or sky. No more. In oh. Jesus.
Jesus' name. I curse that thing and command it to go and don't return. Satan, take your hands off of him. Be whole in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, Father. No more, no more. In Jesus' name. No more. For whatever is going on here. Look what Brother Charlie got for his birthday. But you know what he's going to get for the day after his birthday? Healing. In the name of Jesus, I release the power of God, and I command this arm to be and shoulder to be completely whole. Be healed, be restored to normal, and be a sign and a wonder in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Oh, okay. Everybody stretch forth your hands. Another teeth and jaw miracle. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for working in this mouth. Moving, restoring, repairing in Jesus' name. Oh, you so Behold in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. There's an anointing there, so you're receiving. Amen. Oh. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, turn the mic. Okay. Okay. Both of them? Both ears or just one ear? So did you just have this tested recently? All right, so you want to hear screeching again. <laughs> okay, everybody stretch your hands forward. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we just thank you and praise you for a supernatural work in his hearing. I command these ears, open up and be normal in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Ha, ha, ha. Devil, you're a liar. Amen. Let's bring, where is that frequency? Will someone come test it on him back there? Whoever, was that Brother Ray that had the frequency? <clears throat> you know, if, if there's a gift of healing, which for ears, I have a gift of healing for ears. It should be working here. So I believe, I believe in the name of Jesus, the power of God is working. Amen. Amen. So he can hear me now. Yeah. He wants to hear you. Yeah. Because you know, this is a sad story, but when we were in Sherman and I came back from the Philippines with that story about all those people that were deaf that got healed. And so I had an altar call for that. And one person who was a visitor that day did not answer the altar call, but while they were sitting there, their ear opened up, just popped oh, right yeah. open. And they had been deaf in that ear for most of their life. But they never said anything until later when my husband saw them, a few weeks later. And they said, well, it opened, but I wasn't sure I wanted it open because my husband snores at night. <laughs> now, now, here just shows you the... the uh, mercy of God, that without somebody even engaging themselves to come up and receive, God opened that ear up as a sign and a wonder, and it's a merciful act. But you can shut it right down by saying, I don't think I want it. So we're glad that you want to hear your wife's voice. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Well, let's just worship him because he's worthy. Lord, we worship you. You're worthy to be magnified, worshipped, glorified. We give you praise and honor, Jesus, because you are so good. 
You're so worthy of all of our praise. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we expect to see great manifestations in this place before the year's over. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Great outpourings. I, I just keep saying, Lord, I thank you that this is the year of the local church, and that means great growth and great outpourings. Amen. Great growth and great outpourings. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We're going to have a glorious service, so we'll see you then. God bless you all. We love you.